All right, so we're in Persia now as we go through the story of Esther. And we're showing some historical um, art and facts here that are in the different museums of the world. Here's some, here's Elam, the Elamites or Persian warriors. We can see some of the racial um, features. And we claim that these people were black peoples. In other words, their complexion, their hair textures was what would be called non-European or non-white. So here we have a good demonstration of the Persian the Persian style, because as we get into the book of, of Esther, or Metzhafe Astir, our black Jewish queen, we can even say Ethiopian Hebrew. Now let's get into the scripture right here, first of all. So we have Persian warriors, or per, these are Persian ushers actually right here. These are ushers, yes, ushers into the court. Because when you read the book of, of Esther, you'll come across different different cultural aspects that if you deep end on Hollywood, Hollywood, you are going to get a misinterpretation. A lot of us don't really know history like we should. Once again, right here is um, Elam, Elamite, and Persian um, warriors. This is from the British, no, actually this is the Berlin Museum. Yes, these soldiers right here made it all the way to Berlin. Berlin, but not on their own um, motivation. These things have been stolen from this part of the world, uh, that part of the world, and we see a lot of talk about Iran and Persia in the news. And we briefly um, touched on the book of Daniel, Daniel's prophecy, as well as looking at um, the book of Esther in this particular season that we know as uh, Purim or Furim, which means the dice, lots. But they were used for superstitious purposes, especially by the enemy of the black Jews, whose name was Haman. He was a Agagite or a, a Pepite. In other words, he was of the Apophis the Apophis religion. Not like Stargate Apophis, but if that's the Apophis you know, then Haman, the enemy of the black Jews of Persia, he was of that particular um, religion and persuasion. And he looked at the Beit Israel, the black Jews, as being his enemies. It's so interesting how times um, change, but certain things remain the same. Now, this is a close-up of a Persian soldier right here. And you can clearly see um, the color, the complexion. You can see that it's done with certain artistic accuracy. You can see the, the, the peasy hair, you know, the, the curls, you know, some would call it nigger naps, but they basically stylize them different. Um, let's look at that. This is the Babylonian um, Nebuchadnezzar's dream right there because a picture is very important. People have a false image of history, so and our story in particular. So what we're going to do right here is get into a portion of um, that's uh, Nebuchadnezzar artist rendition, that's Daniel. So the books of Daniel and the book of Esther bring us to a particular region of the world that we do have certain art and facts to basically demonstrate that these peoples were what we would call black or African or or Ethiopians of the further, the farther east. Now here we have a Beit Israel. Um, I think we get this over a Beit Israel page right here. Here's Queen um, Negist Esther or Astir. Now Astir, as we touched on, it means it means a star as in the asterisk. The asterisk is a star. But on further scrutinization, if you look at an asterisk, for example, if you, if you look at an asterisk for a moment, let's bring this up because it's good to get a, a visual um, demonstration of what we, are, what we are saying and what we're trying to demonstrate. Let's, let's type in an asterisk, right? Well, we type them right there as an asterisk. It's very small. So what we're going to do is enlarge it by what what you like 72. Let's see 72. That's a good number right there. 72. Can you see that? 
Now, this is a particular asterisk that is a six-pointed asterisk. There are also eight-pointed asterisks. Usually the printers use um, this, uh, this uh, six-pointed asterisk. In the previous video, we had drew an eight-pointed asterisk, which is like an eight-pointed star, most likely for, um, as they say, uh, metaphysical reasons that we will go into a little bit more in detail as we go forward. So this is what they call an asterisk, aster, and then they add asterisk, asterisk, like a little aster. And in Ethiopic, in the Amharic, Queen Esther is known not as Esther, but she's known as Aster, and Aster is a star. Now, why is this story of Aster so important to us as Ethiopian Hebrews and even to those who have converted to our ancient faith, to the European um, Jews? Well, let's get into this particular story and bring up some more uh, visual um, art and facts. And here we looked in our files, and there's, the, I think, granddaughter of his imperial majesty, who's another Aster, she's known as Aster as well, who has um, written um, favorably concerning her and her husband, the uh, Selassie family. Now, this picture right here on your right hand side actually comes from um, Dr. York and the, the Nawabian community, but it's, it's an accurate picture showing one main thing that Aster or Esther was one of our black Hebrew Ethiopian um, queens who saved her people. I think this is an important aspect of the story. Now, if we go to the first part of Esther, just to give a, a brief overview right here, the first part of Esther. Um, let's get our, our pointer. Get our pointer right here. So this is Metzahafe, Metzahafe, Ase. And here, the very first verse, we're just going to deal with this first verse to put it into its historical context. That's what we began off of some of the art and facts. So we can see what we're speaking about and talking about and what's being said right here. It says, Yeah, take a system, zemin, in dihone. Yeah, him, take a system. Kahind Jamro Iska Etiopia Iska Etiopia Deresa Bemeto Haya Sabata Garoch Lai Negese or Negeshe Negese. The Turgum in English says, Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus, which is known in history as. Xerxes, Xerxes, X-E-R-S-E-S. -E if you remember the movie 300, we was looking for some, um, some pics, but we couldn't find it as when we started to do this uh, lecture right here. But if you recall the movie 300, go look at that movie, the 300 again. And that, that Bati boy who's coming down the pyramid steps and worship the baffle man, all that crazy shit that was in that movie 300, is supposed to be Xerxes. In other words, the one that they, they malign in the movie 300, which is made by Julie, I mean Hollywood, um, the Hollywood Jews, is supposed to be Xerxes, who's this important or aha suerus. So what they do is really confusion. Now, the Mark says Artexis, and the historians have his name as as um, Xerxes. Let's see if they do this right here, if we can just bring this up for a moment, get into that particular name, Ahasuerus, right here, and see. Here's what they have here. So you can see this when you go into the Strong's um, Concordance. It's the H325 word. And they have Aha, Ahash, the Rosh, Ah. Ash vai rosh, ak ash vai rosh. That's the way the the modern Jews, the Masoretic Jews, said. They said, "Oh, shorten." Now they have a p right here. Pa pa ak 
Ash Rosh. Ak Ash Rosh. Esther 10 and 1. It says, of what origin? Persian origin. It's of Persian origin. Ahasuerus or Artak. Artak Xerxes. Artak Xerxes. But in this case, you see what it says, but in this case, there we go. X E R X E S. So if you look at the movie 300 and look at who's who, they basically say that that Bati boy who comes down the, the, the ramp and the steps half naked and everything like that and is um, trying to convince the Greek to join his side, so forth and so on, they'll say, that's Xerxes. But what they're doing is really is misrepresenting history when they do it. So if, if we're speaking about Xerxes, the first thing that comes to most folks' minds who don't study history is that Bati boy in the movie 300. But that's not the Xerxes of the story of um, Esther. So it's a title rather than name of a Persian king. So this is how they try to get away with it. Try to say it's a, it's a title, but not the name of a Persian king. Aha Suarez. But then they give you this right here. So let's go back to the text. Let's go back to the text right here. So we have the the Ethiopic, the Royal Amharic, Metaf. Caduce, and here we have our take assist. It says, Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus or um, Xerxes. This is, it says, Ahasuerus or Xerxes, which reigned, that means ruled as king, Negesha or Negese, which reigned from India, Kahind, right? Jemro, Iska. Ethiopia, even to Ethiopia, or in the Masoretic traditional um, Jewish Bible, it says Kush. So we have Ethiopia, Kush. So this Persian king, he reigned, notice what it says, he reigned from, from India to Ethiopia. So look at the map for a moment, from India to Ethiopia. Then look at ancient Persia. Interesting. We'll get into that, hopefully. Over an hundred and seven and twenty provinces. It says that he ruled over a hundred and twenty seven provinces. So this is also what we mean when we speak about um speak about Ethiopian Hebrew and Hadasha is actually an Ethiopian Hebrew and is one of our illustrious queens. Now, the interesting thing that most uh, uh, Jews, European Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi Jew, is not really going to um, tell you concerning this particular, this particular um, Jewish queen is her racial link and her racial identity. But the story basically tells you it all because he ruled from India, who are black peoples, right, all the way to where? to Ethiopia where we have black peoples. And in fact, the ancient Indian civilization, the Hindus Kush, it's called the Hindus Kush. This is where this name Hindus Kush also comes into the modern academic scholarship and Western sense. And we have this in this one verse right here in, in the Bible, verse 1. Verse 1 concerning the Persian ruler or Artaxis, which some take it as a title, others might say it's a name, but this is Artaxis, which reigned. So there was, a, there was another one, but saying in the days of Artaxis. It's not saying in the days of the king of Persia, but this is more like a personal name. It's like Caesar, the name Caesar. It belonged to a Gaius Caesar, otherwise known as Julius Caesar, and then his family came to rule after him, and they were called the Caesarian or the Caesarian, the Caesaranos or the Caesarian family, and a bunch of many Caesars. But then Caesar was taken to me, a ruler, a, 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 a czar. The, the Roman ruler was the Tsar, in other words, the Tsar, and then Tsar in Russia, so forth. And so and now all these places are in the news once again. All these places are in the news once again. So we have Xerxes, 
Some say this was the first Xerxes, Xerxes the first. And then we have Astia, or her Hebrew name, Hadasha. And she was a female messiah. We could say a black. If you, if, if you want a, a symbol, biblically speaking, a messianic symbol, one who saved their people, a messiah, a female messiah, a female anointed, here you have it in Astia, or Hadasha. Now, she was the wife of Artaxerxes, and she saved all the, the, the Yisraeli, or the, all the Israelites, or the, the Ehud, the black Jews of Persia. Now, we want to go to this verse here, this verse here um, in chapter 4, and we have this Amharic reader right here. So what we're going to do is just play it, you know, play it from, we have it around in the middle roughly of verse 12 right here. And the key verse we want to go to actually is, um, is uh, let's see, 12, uh, we'll go to verse, uh, verse I think, uh, 14, 14. All right, so we're going to scroll down here. We're going from 12, verse 12, 4 and 12, to verse 14. So let's play this for a moment. And... Ah, that's the verse right there. The verse right there. What a mengist, ye met ashu in the z. Lalo gizay in the hona man yaukal. Now here's the advice of of Astyr's, Astyr's, Esther's um, um, her cousin Mordecai. Because we're scrolling a little bit forward in, in 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 the story right here, getting to the the main essence of this. How Esther was 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 in a difficult position indeed she was married and this also shows something very interesting this is why when we look at the racial types in that region we can clearly see that they're black but then they also are you know it's like indo-european but black so we see you know this 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 interesting admixture of 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 races and even in the story of astia becoming the queen in place of vashti to the the Persian ruler is another interesting um, interesting evidence of that. So here in verse uh, twelve, they had told or hatak akratio sima ya aster ya asterin al le madokio sa negro, and they told Mordecai Esther's words. Verse twelve, verse thirteen, and when chapter four it says madokio sim. Akarat sin he did not le aster in di belat allo anchi ben gusa beta sile hon hu ka ai hudo hulu yilk idnalo belesh be libish atasbi then Mordecai Esther's Esther's cousin commanded to answer Esther think not with thyself, that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. See, Esther was, Astir was in a, was in a unique position in this time. You know, she was like, you could say, the, the black woman in the sense that, that, that married, that married into to white folks, you know, like she married, she married white. So she thought, like, whatever's going to happen to the niggas, you know, I'm going to be able to get away, away with it, you know, because I'm in the king's house. So, so this is why we said with Condoleezza Rice and even her cousin, the, the U.N. Um, ambassador, whose also name is Rice, we, we see within them a Esther 
a ester or aster resonance. You understand? But now aster, as we said, aster means star. It refers to a star. We did this in overstanding aster's name and in the overstanding Purim part, and perhaps we just need to, to regurgitate this aspect. Esther, her name means star, the planet Venus. It means happiness. It means good fortune or good fortuna, fortune. Now just note that fortune and Venus, Venus, first of all, is also called Lucifer. This, this is interesting, isn't it? That Venus is that, is that bright in that morning star, or, or the planet Ven Venus, also called Lux Cipher. It brings, it brings the light. It's the, one of the stars of the morning. Now, this is what the Aster, the Aster is the name of a star, but it's a particular, it's a particular star. You understand? Some call it the day star or the star of the morning. But this also means happiness. It means good fortune. The word fortune as well. Um, see, uh, see, what is that? That is uh, 63. Is it Isaiah 63 and verse 11? We was touching on that before about the, the troop, Gad, and the drink offering, the mena. Um, the mena, and there's a similarity with that particular um, mena and mena mena tekel ufarisin that we've touched on earlier. But I and I digress for one particular moment. Let's deal with the beautiful Israelitish woman who became the queen of King Artaxerxes Ahasuerus, Xerxes of Persia. She, with her cousin, with her cousin Mordecai, she became instrumental in saving the lives of the Judahite, the, the, the Judahite people who were in Persia. Now, when we look at the metaphysical of her name, it's also interesting, and we went in some detail of that previously, but just need to go over that right here. You understand, once again, and we see that Astia, the name, it represents, and her story connected with this name, it represents the dissolving power of spiritual love. Now, some say that the book of Esther is interesting because in the book of Esther, they say the name of God is not mentioned in that book even once. Now, there's a very important um, reason for that, but what is the reason for that? What is the reason why we find that throughout the book of of Esther, they say Esther is one of the few books in the Bible that does not even mention the name of God. So some have asked, well, how or why is this book even in the Bible? It doesn't even mention anything about God. What about this omission of the divine name? Well, a remarkable and unique feature of the book of Esther, Metzhafe Aster, is the complete absence of the name of God. And indeed, apart from the, mean, the mention of fasting, apart from what this fast that is proclaimed by um, Nagista Astia, there's no reference, no direct reference to divine providence. And really, besides saying the Jews, the Jews, there's no real mention to Judaism or what we call or know as modern Judaism. It is almost universally agreed that this omission must have been intentional. There must have been an intentional omission, you understand, not against God, but to tell a part of the story of these persecuted people who were on the verge of being uh, genocided. The author seems at times, and we think that the author of the book of Astir was none other than Astir, although that goes against um, white supremacist, uh, male-orientated um, um, Batimanism scholarship that basically doesn't attribute anything to women, even when it's kind of clear that women have a leading role, but this is not so, was not so in black biblical times. We gave credit where credit is due, so the book of Esther is called after the name of the heroine of the book, Esther. But the author, who we think is Esther herself, seems at times even to go out of his or her way to avoid mentioning the divine name. 
Now, in 4 and 14, it's very interesting, and we're going to reference 4 and 14. That's what we um, um, just pointed to just, just recently. And that's part of the, you know, that's part of the, um, the, or the popular reference of this book, you know, that you've been brought to the kingdom for a time such as this, a time such as this. Many preachers and pastors preaching on Esther usually use that kind of, um, you know, usually use that part of the verse for a time such as this. Now, the reason for the omission can only be surmised. Um, some say perhaps since the, the Megala was to be read at the annual merrymaking of Purim, which, when considerable license was permitted, some say that the author feared that the divine name might be profaned if it occurred in the reading. Perhaps they say he or she feared that the book might be profanely treated by Gentiles, and then it was non-Jews, because of its story of the triumph of the Ju Judeans or Judahites over their enemies. But Whatever the reason for the omission of the name of God, the sense of divine providence pervades the book. The statement of Mordecai in um, chapter 4, verse 14, it shows unfailing trust in God's providential care for his people. And a and, uh, quote from Psalms um, CXXI or Psalm 21 and 4, he that keepeth Israel doth neither slumber nor sleep might well be the motto of this particular narrative. Now we read this from from the the Megala, the five uh, megalot by Cohen, and it's in the introduction to the book of Aster, the Masoretic um, um, commentary to the book of Aster. Now, what's interesting about what we find in their, their, their speculations of why the divine name is not mentioned in this particular book, if you notice in both reasons, they mention fear, 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 fear. You, 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 you've over that this time, Mary making, but why wasn't there? Because one's feared, feared, feared. So their only, um, their only way of trying to rationalize this, the so-called Jews, the converted Khazars and Ashkenazi Jews, because this story is not really about them, it's about us, but in their conversion, they gain great strength from it. And in um, black Christians and even among some of the, the, the Hebrews or Jews, avoiding this story, it, it, it also does us damage because we're not, we're not really recognizing the providential care of God. And I think why people avoid this story, and this story is so little considered um, in, um, in the black church and among black folks is because, first of all, the racial identity has been, has been uh, suppressed. And then when we look at the Jewish documents and the commentaries of European Jews, we keep coming across this fear, this fear. There was fear that they feared the name, the book might be profane. And then the author feared that the divine name might be profane. And they, they feared that the book might be profanely treated by the Gentiles. Everything is fear. But see, Esther, or Esther she represents the dissolving, the dissolving power, the dissolving power of spiritual love. In other words, the dissolving power of Jah's love. And this is the antidote to a dictatorial um, or an imperious will or a, the will of the dragon or, or a satanic will or, or the evil will that is summed up in this story by Haman. By, by Haman, the, the antagonist of the story. So Astia becomes the, the, the protagonist. Now, Queen Esther, or Astia, she had all her relatives who are the Ihud or the Judahites, the Jews for short, the spiritual thoughts. So the Jews in this particular story re, um, represent the spiritual thoughts. They, they joined her in a fast. Now, this means that we, too, learning from the lesson, the spiritual, metaphysical lesson of this story, we must deny all selfish desires 
out of our love, which is truly our true love is Jah's love, out of Jah's love before we use it, using Jah's love in softening and overcoming the so-called imperious will. When this consciousness of Jah's love stands in the inner court of our very being, we cannot help uh, acceding or ascending, uh, acceding to its demands. We can't help but humbling to the demands of Jah's love. So Esther or Esther also speaks of unselfish love, and unselfish love is fearless. So, so because she's in this fear less, it's not about she don't want to use the name, but also the command teaches us not to use the name in vain. So this is a book in the Bible where the name Jah or the name Yah or Elohim or the divine names are not thrown casually all over the place, but we see divine providence. Providence, and what's interesting is that the heroine in a book where the where the heroine is a woman, right? That the name of God is not used directly in that book, but we see the work of God. You understand? We see the birth. You understand of 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 these ideas in real time. I use the word birth pointedly here, but we'll get into that a little bit as we move forward. But this book is about unselfish love, and unselfish love is fearless because it, it's forgetfulness of self. So at first, Aster, and this is the part in Chapter 4 that we're at, um, Aster, she has to be reminded by her cousin, you understand, that even though you're in the king's, even though you're in the king's palace, right, and he doesn't really know really your backstory, as it were, right? Um, don't think that when this thing goes its full round that you will escape. So it's interesting what Mordecai, if we go back to what Mordecai says in chapter 4, verse 14, and here we'll go over this from the 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 uh, uh, Megala, it says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, in other words, this is the time when she was in the position to speak up. But Mordecai, her cousin, knew, you understand, not just her being a woman or whatever, no, but being in this situation where you have to speak something contrary to the prevailing attitudes with, a, with an enemy like Haman. So, forth and so that's why I likened it with Condoleezza Rice. Remember that vid that we put up before? Go back and check that video out about how Con we says Condoleezza Rice like a Esther. Google it, Condoleezza Rice Esther, and check out the video. I'm sure some have probably commented on it to dismiss it because they, they are not – black Jews. They're not Hebrews, so the story doesn't really affect them. They don't care if we get genocided in the ghetto or not. You understand? But Esther was prompted. You understand? Even though she understood right and wrong, she had to be prompted by her cousin to say something. You understand? To say something. And in saying something, that was doing something. And ultimately, that worked to save the black Jews of Persia. So Mordecai had bade them to return answer to Esther. Don't think with thyself, verse 13, don't think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. Don't think it's going to be better for you because you're in the White House. You understand? You know, or because you are close to the president or the king or whatnot, so forth and so on. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then will relief and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. It's interesting what Mordecai says right there. Mordecai shows his faithfulness that he says that, listen, you're in a position to do something about this situation that we're under and, and this threat of, of, of genocide. But even if you don't do anything about it, don't think that deliverance will come from somewhere else. I liken what Mordecai is saying to, to Aster, right, uh, to, to his, uh, his, 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 his cousin, is, is very much likened to what um, 
um, and in the Judges. It's the book of Judges, of Deborah, Deborah. I think I think it's similar to what happened with Deborah and 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 who was it? Uh, uh, Barak. I think it was Barak. We'll go into that a little bit later on. Anyway, we're all in confusion right here. But the main point that Mordecai is saying is if you hold your peace, Aster, then relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from another place. But thou, and here's the key, listen to what he says, says to his cousin, he says, but you and your father's house, remember they're relatives, they're related, they're cousins. He says, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether thou art not come to royal estates or to the kingdom, in other words, for such a time as this. And this is the key phrase when ones tend to, um, in Christian and even some Jewish writings, when they tend to, to make commentary or preach or sermonize on the book of Esther, this is one of the main um, um, rememberable uh, 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 quotes and everything. Um, a time such as this. A time such as this. Now, the footnote says down here that Mordecai's rebuke is stern. Mordecai rebukes his cousin very sternly and uncompromisingly. You see, John's love, being unselfish also about truth has to be very un... un it can't com you can't compromise the truth. You can't compromise the fate of John's people. So Mordecai's rebuke is stern and uncompromising in the face of the calamity which threatened the whole black Jewish population of the empire. And this is a very similar situation of black folks, the lost sheep, in the Americas and the Caribbean, even right now. There was no place for considerations of personal safety. You know, like some people say, well, I don't want to speak the truth, because if I speak the truth, they're going to come and get me. And then, well, that means that they're not moving by Jah's love. They're not moving by unselfish love. You understand? And we look at the greats amongst our people. The, you know, I mean, I say the greats, those who, are, who have done something um, memorable, especially in, 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 in saving our people or, or speaking up for the lost sheep, the black sheep in the Americas and the Caribbean. We can see this sentiment of Jah's love given manifestation. Verse 14, from another place. From another place, from another place, um, Mordecai is obviously referring, it's quite obvious, you know, saying that he's referring to divine help. But the author deliberately, they say, deliberately avoids the use of God's name. See, because this message had to be sent, you have to remember that what situation they were in. You always say, it's like when we say that, that yes, Aina is Rastafari, but it doesn't mean that all Rastas, Rastafari have dreadlocks. You understand? Or wear Selassie shirts. You, you see, so we have Rastafari brothers and sisters, Ethiopian Hebrew brothers and sisters, even in government offices, you understand, of, of this empire and this kingdom. You see, so we have to, as much to be bigger, you understand, than we've ever been. You know, saying broader an outlook and, and mostly more spiritual, moving in that spiritual power. And moving in that spiritual power means that we have to be stern, we have to rebuke when necessary, and we have to be uncompromising because where we're at right presently in 2012, in this present time, we're in the face of calamity. We're in the face of destruction. We're in the face of even eminent genocide as the once lost but now found Beta Israel. This threatens the whole people. You know what I'm saying? This threatens actually all of humanity, but at the eye of the storm, the pupil of God's eye, is we as the once lost but now found Beta Israel, or the black sheep of the family, Ethiopian Hebrews. So Mordecai, Mordecai, he rebukes very strongly, but he says also that, that, that you and your family in your father's house, he says, will perish. By what? By, by what do you think will perish? What do you think he's referring to? He's referring to by divine judgment. For what reason? For what reason? She could have said, why am I going to get involved in this? This is not bothering, you know, me or whatnot like that. 
You understand? Know she would have gotten punished. Her family would have gotten punished. So when we speak about the role that an, that an individual has, you know, this is the period, excuse me, this is the period of time that, um, you know, many of us have mourned the, the loss and the passing of uh, Whitney Houston, for example. You, you know what I mean? And some might think that um, she did not have a, a, a duty to we as the black people. But we can see in the Whitney Houston scenario, in a sense, is a, a 180 degrees opposite, you understand, know of our black queen, Astia. You see, but Astia herself, too, she had to be prompted. This is what we learned very interesting in this particular story. She had to be prompted, in a sense, to act. She had to be prompted to do. And part of that prompting was saying, listen, if you neglect, if you are negligent of your duty to Jah, as well as your duty to Jah's people, guess what? You and your father's house will perish, will perish by divine judgment for the neglect, for negligence to the duty. You are the woman. You are in the position. You have the ability to stop this genocide. And thankfully, Queen Esther, Negist Astir, our sister Hadasha, she responded, you see, and for such a time as this, for such a time as this, Mordecai had realized the divine purpose of Astir's choice as queen. You see, he began to understand that there was a divine purpose to this particular choice for him to be that queen to the Persian ruler. Now, of course, the Persian ruler, he was not a Hebrew, you understand, but it was to work out for the best. Esther had made known, had not made known her people nor her kindred. If you look at, at, at Esther chapter 2, verse 10, this is what we mean when we say we have many of our lost sheep people, some of them who know who they are and some of them who will learn who they are. And if we can help them in any way, we give thanks and praise. You see right here in verse, in verse 10 right here? Do you see verse 10? You see what verse 10 says? It says, Yehinnim in dat nager merdokyos azizoat neberna. Astera hizbawana o wagenwan ala tenagarech. Esther, Astir, had not shooed her people nor her kindred. In other words, she had not made known who her people were or who her kindred, who her hizb was, who her wagon was. For Mordecai, Merdokios, Mordecai had charged her that she should not shoo it. So Mordecai had told her, don't, don't let them know who your people are, that your people are the Beta Israel, and that your Wogan are the Ihud or the black Jews. Don't, don't, don't say nothing about that. So it was Mordecai who said not to tell it because Mordecai must have reasoned something like this. Mordecai must have said something like this in his thoughts. If Astia is chosen queen, Negist, it can only be because God, Ha Elohim, El Elohe Israel, desires to make her the instrument in some way of his purpose. If then she reveals the fact that she is a Hebrewess, that she is a black Jewess, you understand? And therefore a member of a subject people, a member of a persecuted people, a people who were subject, in, in, was in the same condition as we lost sheep black folks are even today, she will prejudice her choice. And, there, and thereby the possibility of becoming God's instrument. 
so this interpretation was suggested in the Midrash, the Midrash, quote, he thought to himself, how is it possible that the righteous, this righteous maiden, should be married to a non-Israelite? How is that possible? Some would say that that is impossible. How could this, 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 this Hebrew, this Israelite maiden, you understand, possibly, you understand, possibly be married to one who is, perhaps he was uncircumcised. One thing is sure, that he was a heathen from a strict Hebrew interpretation. But this is also teaches us something here as well, that Mordecai's sensibility was more in divine, you know, more in alignment with the divine dictates. So, he thought well about this, and it's a good thing that he did think so well about this. So this is a, you know, we could call this, what is this, an interracial relationship? You know what I'm saying? Astia and Artaxis, Xerxes, you understand? Regardless of all of that, you understand? Know it's almost like an Obama sort of situation, you know, in reverse somewhat, but still it's the same sort of situation. It's not, it's not advocate this, but it says that in this particular situation, this particular time, it all worked out that the righteous maiden should be married to a non-Israelite. It must be because some great calamity is going to befall Israel, who will be delivered, who would be delivered through her. So this will mean that she was a female messiah. She was the one who was spiritually, and even as the queen, she was anointed also. She was anointed for this particular purpose. So, the, so this concealment has been so often condemned. Many people say, why did, did Mordecai say that? She should have just said what she was. Yet, it's necessary that concealment be done. So we learn some wisdom. We can even quote Yeshua the Moshiach, Joshua, where he says, be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Here is a case of Mordokio, so Mordecai, being a wise as a serpent, but harmless all the same as a dove. So even though some might condemn this, you understand, um, this concealment so often condemned, that it would be well to quote some of the many other explanations of it. Now, Rashi, you know what I'm saying? He comments that she did not declare her royal origin. Others say that, well, she actually had a royal origin, i.e., that um, she was descended, some say, from the family of King Saul, so that the king might think that she was of humble origin and therefore send her away. Ibn Ezra, he remarked, um, so that she might observe her religious obligations secretly. If she declared her faith, she would be forced to transgress or perhaps forced to um, convert to the prevailing faith of, of, of the Persian Empire of the time. Now, the, the Yaukut, it, it ascribes the concealment to Mordecai, Mordokios' modesty. He feared the advancement and publicity which would come to him if his relationship, being the cousin, to the queen were known. An explanation well in keeping with Mordecai's um, self-effacing disposition. So Mordecai is also a big hero, you understand, of this particular story right here. But it's very clear that she had come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So Mordecai had realized the divine purpose and, um, of Esther's choice as, as queen. And Esther, too, she understands that her special position, it also entails a corresponding special obligation. You know how you hear Negroes today, they talk about, well, you know, like they got to be for themselves. They don't care about black folks. 
you know, like they obviously don't recognize what Esther or Aster, you understand, the lesson of Aster, you understand, the lesson of Queen Esther. Because um, then Esther bade them return answer to Mordecai. So we have Esther now bidding them to return answer to Mordecai. And that answer was go gather together all, all the Ehud, all the black Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me. In other words, I'm going to do this, but here's why. So we see the spiritual power that we understand now, the, you know, the spiritual power that, that she's saying, pray for me in the sense of more than that, fast ye for me. And neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast in like manner. And so will I go in to the king, which is not according to the law. Now, one thing we have to understand about this, about Persian custom, that anybody who goes into the king unannounced basically gets killed. And, you know, the Persians and many of, many of these um, cultures, you know, they had strict rules. There's no if and, but I didn't know, or whatever like that. No, this is basically how it was done. You know, where they make a law, and even if they find the law is bad, that law stays in effect until they come up with a new one. If it's challenged, they have to stick to the law. So they were, you talk about legalists. So she says right here, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. What a beautiful sentiment. What a real spiritual sentiment. She's like, she's like come what may, you understand? I got to do this. I got to save my people. I got to speak up on their behalf and if I perish basically I perish it's a simple but sublime and it's a courageous statement of resignation to Jah's will she had resignation to Jah's will it reminds me of Yaakov's um, exclamation if I be bereaved I am bereaved in other words you know you know if I pain I pain it's almost like they say uh, oh, who for dead for dead you understand? But the, but the truth, you understand? And justice must be done. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Astir had commanded him. And that was fast ye for me. Prayer must have accompanied the fasting, as it always does. Because if, if you're not praying, if you're not in a spiritual state of mind and you're not eating, you know, you're going to be thinking, you know, you're going to be wandering, you wondering, like, how many more days I got? You know what I mean? But prayer must accompany the fasting. But again, notice something in this area. The author of this book, you understand, Metzhafe Aster, avoids any language that might necessitate <laughs> the mention of God. Remember, remember the position they were in. They were in a position where enemies were gambling on the lives of the black Jewish people. That's no different than right now. They were ga rolling the dice. In other words, that's what poor porim actually means. Three days, night and day. It need not have been a continuous fast, right, for three days. Now, the Midrash, it asserts that food was taken at sunset, at the sunset of each day. Now, Mordecai, he went his way. The Hebrew word can, can mean either he crossed over or it can mean he transgressed. Depends on how one points it or interprets it. Now, in the Talmud, um, Samuel, or Rebbe Samuel, he adopts the first interpretation. He says that, well, when it says that Mordecai, Mordecai, he, he went his way, basically means that he crossed over. So that's the first interpretation of Targum. Now, and Rab, Rab chose the second. Now, Samuel, he interpreted crossed the water. He crossed the water, and it is a fact that the palace of Susa, the palace of Susa was separated by the river um, uh, 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 Koaspes from the city. Now, this is probably, people interpret, what is meant. Now, Rab, he actually takes the meaning to be 
transgress the Passover law by fasting on a festival day. This is how Rob interprets it. So um, yeshiva students have argued over this, but it makes for an interesting debate. He held that the three fast days included the first day of Fasika, Pesach. The decree was issued on the 13th of Nisan, according to um, uh, Esther chapter 3, verse 12. And rabbinical law or rabbinical views is that the fast days followed immediately. Now, according to the Midrash, they were the 13th, 14th, and 15th. Now, according to Rashi, they were the 14th, 15th, and 16th of Nisan. Now, the Midrash, it represents some um, Mardokios or Mordecai as protesting to ask their, quote, but these three days include the first day of Passover. And Esther, or Aster as replying, if there be no Israel, how can there be a Fasica? How can there be a Passover? So my sisters, my, my black sisters, I wanted to do this, um, this particular vid, especially for you, because many of you all have rightly complained that, you know, it seems to be that, you know, some things presented from the Bible are somewhat sexist, or, and, and there's, you know, there's, there, there's, there's no real um, mention. You know, like, where are the examples? Where are these? We could talk about David and Goliath and Jacob and Jacob's ladder and Moses standing up to Pharaoh and, you know, and, 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 and um, so many other stories. But where are the stories? Where's the history of courageous, courageous black women? I mean, black women such as Astia, who in some senses, even among the Iranian Jews today, they think that Astia, they pray to her or they pray and invoke her name rather and say that she can do miracles. You know, the, the Jews, the remaining Jews of um, Iran who actually say that they are descendant you know, they are descendants of the Jews who were saved by Esther or Esther. And so we, 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 we touch on this story briefly for, for you sisters, and um, we'll try to touch on some more aspects of this particular, particular story. And we, and, we, and we also thank the Beta Israel of Ethiopia, you know, for, for keeping Esther or Esther's name you know, name alive and name relevant among the, the, the black sheep of the family. So, brothers and sisters, more to come. Shalom, Aras Teferi, and have an overcoming Purim. Shalom. <laughs>